Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Bunker. In today's rebuttal, I'm going to be taking a look at the 149th Gilead graduation, which took place on January 16th, 2021. But we only get to look at the footage from this graduation now in June 2021, because it's taken this long for the organization to release the footage of the talks that were given during the ceremony. In fact, part one of this footage is being released as the June JW Broadcasting episode, which is presented or hosted by Ron Curzon. He just basically introduces the footage and then makes a few concluding remarks at the end. What I'm interested in is what was said in the talks so for this rebuttal, we're going to be looking at some presentations by various governing body members and governing body helpers and other watchtower officials or higher ups. Anyway, there's quite a bit to talk about. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. You're well aware of the unique time in world events, a global pandemic. But what makes this class so unique? A normal class of Gilead consists of 50-some students. The 149th class is made up of just 25. Your class is abnormal. But why? You know why. But let me share your experience with the Worldwide Brotherhood. Those who had been invited to attend this class of Gilead had begun to arrive at the Educational Center in Patterson, New York. The 25 students in this class actually arrived in mid-March of 2020. And as we all know, it was at that time that the coronavirus was declared to be a global pandemic. Most travel was shut down. The rest of their classmates could not come. Due to government restrictions on educational facilities, the 149th class had to be postponed. You students were stuck at Patterson, New York, with no classes in session. Commendably, many of you were able to work remotely for your home branch office in the interim. Finally, here in New York, Governmental agencies allowed for educational facilities to again conduct classes, if physical distancing could be maintained. With just 25 of you, that was possible in the Gilead Lecture Hall. So, we have only 25 abnormal students who will graduate today. To clarify, it is the number of students that makes this class abnormal. But I'm told by your instructors that individually you are very normal. Yes, thank you for clarifying that, Samuel Hurd. <laughs> he seems to be doing something of a stand-up routine at the beginning of this Gilead graduation. I say a stand-up routine, he's quite obviously sitting down, but he does seem to fancy himself as something of a comedian which we're going to see, I'm afraid, more evidence of <laughs> as this footage unfolds. But yes, he's giving us there some background on what happened with the 149th Gilead class, the fact that they were stuck from March through to, I think, August 2020 without being able to do their course. And then finally, governmental restrictions eased making it possible for half of the normal number of students to sit down and do the course, which, if memory serves, is about six months for Gilead. I did the Ministerial Training School back in 2005, which is now called the School for Kingdom Evangelizers, and that was a two-month course, and the idea was that it was a condensed version of Gilead. So Gilead students do six months and the course is elongated with students doing essentially volunteer labour for the Bethel Complex or the Patterson Educational Centre 
in between their studies, thus making it six months instead of two. But I just found this part interesting because it's talking here about yielding to governmental restrictions and making sure the organization falls in line with whatever the government is directing in terms of how to respond to a global pandemic, I just can't help but find it quite hypocritical that the organization will fall over itself to comply with the law when it comes to avoiding a deadly disease that incidentally directly threatens the governing body because due to their age and I'm sure various health problems that some of them may have, they are most at risk. So it's in their interests, isn't it? To make sure that the community of followers that they're living with is shielded from the worst effects of this global pandemic, and they are going to comply with whatever the government says to that end. But when it comes to complying with the law, when it comes to protecting children, well, that seems to be a different matter altogether, doesn't it? The way they deal with child protection and the handling of child abuse is to say, well, if the state is going to force us to report the abuse, uh, okay, but by the way, we'll jump through hoops to avoid doing it even in states where there is mandatory reporting if there is a clergy penitent loophole that we can take advantage of. So just for me, the double standard here is sickening. We have a few statistics to share about the 149th class. Of the 25 students, eight are married couples, seven are single brothers, and there are two single sisters in the class. I guess they're still single. All were serving at a Bethel branch facility or at a regional translation office before attending school. So now you all see what I mean about Sam Hurd with his attempts at comedy. Apparently the very fact that some of the Gilead students were single is a reason for joking. That is itself a cause of laughter. Yeah, that's hilarious, Sam. I'm inwardly rolling over in hysterics at the idea that some of the Gilead students might not be still single. The students are from 14 different countries and speak 29 different languages. Their average age is 41. That's a good age. 44 years ago, I was 41. The 25 of you in this class of Gilead are expected to strengthen and stabilize God's people where you are assigned. Well, what does that entail? For you brothers, in time it may mean you will be given more responsibility. But your training has given you another way to stabilize fellow believers in your assignment. And this applies to all 25 of you, whether brothers or sisters. You've been elevated while here at the Gilead. In fact, in the territory of Gilead in the Bible, the elevation changes dramatically. In the Jordan Valley, Gilead was 690 feet, 210 meters below sea level. But traveling east to the dome-like mountainous region of Gilead, the elevation rises to over 3,300 feet or 1,000 meters. You students came to Gilead below sea level. But with daily Bible study and lectures, you have been elevated. Throughout the past five months, your faith has grown. Your spirituality has been enhanced. Your Christian personality has been refined. You have been elevated. 
you will be going out to your assignment, not so much for a heap of witness, but as a heap of example. In this way, you will strengthen and stabilize those you work with at the branch and those you associate with in your congregations. So thankfully, it seems Sam Hurd is done with his comedy routine. <laughs> Goodness, that's over. Wow. I mean, I guess they're bad jokes anyway, but they're made even worse by the fact that Sam Hurd is reading his jokes off an auto cue. I mean, how do they really expect this is going to look on camera? Reading jokes off an auto cue. No naturalness, no sincerity, no spontaneity. Jokes have to be spontaneous, don't they? If you can see them coming a mile off, they cease to be funny. Sam Hurd doesn't seem to understand remotely how comedy works. Anyway, he's done with his jokes and he's moved on to more serious matters, which is the fact that the Gilead graduates need to be a stabilizing influence now that they've finished their studies, they've finished their education as essentially watchtower representatives, as people who now know the organization inside out, they now have enhanced Bible knowledge, and the expectation is that they go out into the field or they go to their branch offices, their local Bethels, and amaze everyone with the wisdom they've learned by spending six months at Patterson. But I hope you noticed the incredibly patronizing, condescending language Sam Hurd used to describe how the Gilead students were when they first arrived at Patterson. He said, you students came to Gilead below sea level. But with daily Bible study and lectures, you have been elevated. Am I the only one who was watching him saying that, thinking, this is how you view ordinary rank-and-file Jehovah's Witnesses, isn't it? You view ordinary rank-and-file Jehovah's Witnesses who aren't at Patterson, who aren't blessed by being in proximity with you and your colleagues, who aren't studying the Bible with you and learning directly from you and having you bestow your wisdom upon them, you view ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses as, quote, below sea level. In other words, beneath you. That's how you, Samuel Hurd, think of those whom you lead, of your followers. That for me, came across loud and clear. Yet another in a long line of examples of the governing body letting their guard down when a camera is pointing at them and inadvertently letting slip what they really think of their followers. The Bible is a wonderful book. It's a book that we should just enjoy reading. So for this talk, I thought I'd give a couple of suggestions for adding to our reading pleasure. Here's the first. Don't pass quickly over the details. Stop and investigate. And at times, you'll be very glad you did. What is it with David Splain and his seeming obsession with telling Jehovah's Witnesses not just to read their Bibles, but how they should be reading their Bibles? When you're reading the Bible, try to get the whole picture. What about Joseph's half-brothers and Joseph himself? What do you know about them? What about Judah, Simeon, Levi, Dan, Naphtali? What do you know? So write down their characteristics and try to figure out how they might get along. Bible reading isn't a chore. It's a joy. Get the whole picture of what you're reading and you'll enjoy it even more. I'd like to talk to you on the theme, do the math. Yes, you heard right, do the math. Sometimes doing the math is the only way we can make a timeline or get interesting background information that makes our Bible reading more enjoyable. 
And you do want to make your Bible reading more enjoyable, don't you? Of course you do. This, for me, is just one of many examples of why it simply doesn't work for the governing body to throw themselves in front of the camera at every opportunity, whether it's in a JW broadcasting episode or at a Gilead graduation, which then gets broadcast in front of millions of Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't have self-awareness and they don't understand how incredibly condescending and patronizing and arrogant they come across when they're trying to impress us with their knowledge. And in David Splain's case, he seemingly leaps at any opportunity to impress us with his deep, profound knowledge of the Bible and how important it is that we read the Bible the way he does, so that, for example, when we're reading the Bible, we do the math and fixate over such questions as, did Noah and Abraham, did their lives overlap in any way? How do we construct a timeline that will tell us whether the lives of these Bible characters overlapped by maybe a year or two? That is the level of obsession that David Splain expects from Jehovah's Witnesses when it comes to their Bible research. And the message, clearly, that he's sending out is, I am the sort of person who would do this research. I spend hours and hours in my office <laughs> devoting myself to these mathematical exercises <laughs> where I drill down to the scriptures and try to find out all of these juicy details, <laughs> questions that no one else is asking, I'm asking them, and I, David Splain, will get to the bottom of these mysteries. That seems to me to be the underlying message here. And to give us one example of the profound truths, the profound wisdom that can be gleaned from essentially <laughs> mental masturbation on Bible verses, David Splain is now going to regale us with his knowledge about He-Man. Now let's take an example. You're reading in the book of First Chronicles. Now there are a lot of names in First Chronicles, and you come across the name Heman. If you were just interested in covering material, you'd probably pass over it and go on to the next verse. But you're not in a rush, and you notice a cross-reference beside the name. It refers to you to First Chronicles 6.33. So you decide to investigate, and in doing so, you learn something heartwarming about Jehovah. Let's do that. First Chronicles chapter 6, it says, These are the men who served with their sons. Of the Kohathites, Heman, the singer, son of Joel, son of Samuel. So this Heman was Samuel's grandson. Now, what do we know about his family situation? Well, his father, Joel, and his uncle, Abijah, were judges but they had a terrible reputation. They'd rule in your favor if you could pay enough, but if you were poor, forget it. And uh, the whole country knew about it. Uh, at one point, uh, the Bible says that all the elders of Israel came to Samuel and said they didn't want Joel and Abijah as judges anymore. They wanted a king. Jehovah was furious, and he couldn't have been too happy with Joel and Abijah either. Now, can you imagine the effect that this corruption had on the reputation of Heman's family? The shame? But like Hezekiah, Heman didn't allow his father's bad example to paralyze him. Heman developed his own personal relationship with Jehovah. How do we know? We followed a few clues. We followed a few cross-references, and we came to 1 Chronicles chapter 25 and verse 5. Let's do that. It says, All of these were sons of Heman, a visionary of the king in matters pertaining to the true God, to his glory. Thus, the true God gave Heman fourteen sons and three daughters. Did you see it? A visionary of the king. What was a visionary? It was a kind of prophet. Now let's see, Samuel was a prophet. 
And now Heman was a prophet. Do you see what's heartwarming? Jehovah was dealing with Heman in much the same way he had dealt with his grandfather. Jehovah does not hold the sins of the fathers against the sons. Well, I'm not so sure about that, David, for reasons I will share with you shortly. But wow, <laughs> what a dull, tedious exercise he's just dragged us all through. If you weren't paying attention or if your attention got diverted during this bizarre rambling about Heman, it makes it more interesting if you imagine Heman as He-Man, doesn't it? But if you fail to follow along with this, what he's essentially saying is a grandson of Samuel became a prophet even though his father was a bad dude. So isn't it great, isn't it heartwarming that Jehovah didn't hold it against Heman that his father wasn't very pleasant? Isn't that heartwarming? Doesn't it show that Jehovah is fair and just and doesn't hold it against you what previous generations of your family did? Well, I see your reference of First Chronicles, David Splain, First Chronicles chapter 6, and I raise you Exodus 20 verses 4 to 6, which says, you must not make for yourself a carved image or a form like anything that is in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. You must not bow down to them nor be enticed to serve them, for I, Jehovah your God, I'm a God who requires exclusive devotion, bringing punishment for the error of fathers upon sons, upon the third generation, and upon the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loyal love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. What was it that David Splain said again? Jehovah does not hold the sins of the fathers against the sons. That seems to directly contradict what I've just read there in Exodus. So which is it, David Splain? God does hold a grudge and does punish sons for the crimes of fathers, or he doesn't. At this point, all you're doing is confusing us. But again, the whole point of this long rambling lecture seems to be about impressing Jehovah's Witnesses with how learned David Splain is and how wise and profound he is when it comes to his Bible knowledge. Some, even in full-time service, have a hard time with it because they had a rough family background and they may feel that they're worthless. Mary's is a case in point. I'm going to call her Mary. Now, Mary's father was so violent that at times Mary, her mom, and her siblings had to get up in the middle of the night and run for their lives. And to the neighbors, they were that family. To make it worse, they were poor. So all this made Mary feel worthless. Until? Until the day when she started studying with the witnesses. She developed her own relationship with Jehovah, and she accepted him as her father. And today? Mary's a pioneer. How does she feel about her life? Here's what she wrote. Jehovah is constantly looking for those who want a friendship with him. And here's a touching point. He's even looking into the hearts of children. Isn't that nice? Now, there are two lessons here. As Heman's example shows, our family background doesn't define who we are. Jehovah will deal with us as individuals. And a second example, one for the elders. Be like Jehovah. Treat each member of the family as an individual. Don't lump them all in together. Wow. Well, that's chilling. David Splain, as a governing body member, knows all about the way child abuse is mishandled in the organization. He knows all about the way children are essentially thrown under the bus routinely when it comes to child abuse being covered up, 
and not being reported to the authorities so that predators can go on and abuse more children. He knows all about this, and yet he has the gall to suggest that Jehovah is, quote, He is even looking into the hearts of children. If Jehovah's really doing that, David Splain, then why is he ignoring the pain of children, the misery and heartache of children who are being left behind by your group's horrendous policies when it comes to child abuse? And there's also the group's horrendous track record on domestic violence, which is essentially what we're hearing about here. Obviously, the abuse supposedly happened in a family that wasn't of Jehovah's Witness family. But nonetheless, how can they talk about a situation involving domestic violence when they put children and they put women and men in these abusive situations by telling abused spouses, you're not allowed to divorce? We had this very clearly explained to us in a recent JW Broadcasting episode where it was, I think, Robert Suranko who said words to the effect of, there's never an excuse to get divorced outside of adultery. What though if no adultery has been committed? But for some reason, two people who are married to each other just don't like each other any longer. Divorce is not an option. An organization that engineers these abusive situations by telling abused spouses that they can't escape, they can't move on with their lives, they can't remarry to someone that isn't hitting them or isn't abusing them. An organization that has these woeful policies has the goal to regale us with this story as though, oh, it's only on the outside where domestic violence happens. Once someone becomes a Jehovah's Witness, they can leave all of that violence and all of that misery behind. And hey, they can become a pioneer and that will make everything somehow better. And what is it with David Splain saying, this girl is called Meris, this lady is called Meris, but I'm going to call her Mary. Meris is a case in point. I'm going to call her Mary. Well, either her name is Meris or it isn't. Now that you've told us that her name is Meris, why are you then changing her name to Mary, seemingly as a matter of convenience for you? Oh, I'm going to call her Mary. <laughs> that part made no sense. But most grating of all is the fact that David Splain, despite his position... And despite knowing what he knows, having a grandstand view of how much misery he is causing, along with his fellow governing body members, by perpetuating these abusive policies, not just with regards to domestic violence, but also with regards to child sex abuse, how he can stand there and pretend that becoming a Jehovah's Witness and becoming a pioneer will make everything okay is completely beyond me. Well, we haven't discussed anything earth-shaking here, and that isn't the point of this talk. But if you investigate the details and fill in the blanks, it'll contribute to the pleasure you derive from reading the Bible. And if Bible reading is a pleasant experience for you, you'll have no trouble to arrange a schedule of daily Bible reading. Enjoy! Thank you, Brother Splain. We enjoyed your presentation and we look forward to enjoying our Bible reading even more. Oh yeah, I can't wait to get stuck into my Bible reading and put into practice all of the wisdom that David Splain has just given us about the need to obsess over inconsequential details concerning obscure Bible characters. My enjoyment of reading the Bible by doing that will surely just go through the roof. <laughs> but yes, this is what Jehovah's Witnesses are expected to do. Just fixate over these unimportant details that no one cares about. And you'll notice at the end there, 
it's not just about having meaningful Bible reading according to when you feel like doing Bible reading. It's about reading the Bible every single day. To arrange a schedule of daily Bible reading. Enjoy! Enjoy! <laughs> yeah, I'm totally going to enjoy doing that. But what we have here, being serious for a moment, viewers, what we have here is yet more expectation being piled on Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not enough to be attending all the meetings. It's not enough to be doing the preaching work. It's not enough to be doing your own preparation and study and that kind of thing. You have to be reading the Bible every day and not just reading the Bible, but reading the Bible the way David Splain wants you to read the Bible to the point where you're obsessing over these ridiculous, inconsequential details. And if you're not doing that, then there's clearly a problem with you. Clearly, you're not taking your faith seriously enough. I really do not miss being a Jehovah's Witness and constantly being reminded of all of these ways in which I'm somehow falling short and somehow not living up to expectations. When I was a newly appointed circuit overseer, the elders in a congregation that I was serving expressed concern about a sister who was missing meetings. They asked me if I would be willing to make a shepherding visit. Of course, I was happy to do that. The arrangements were made, another elder accompanied me, and uh, I shared all of the appropriate verses about meeting attendance. The sister listened, and as we were leaving, she looked me in the eye, and she said, you don't have a clue. At the time, I thought she was being disrespectful. But as I thought about it, I came to wish that instead of showing up with all the appropriate verses, I had showed up with all of the appropriate questions. What do you want me to do for you? How may I help? What's been happening in your life? Those kinds of questions allow you to render meaningful assistance. I learned from that experience. I hope you can learn from my mistake. Don't make the mistake of thinking you know what a person wants or needs. Jesus did know, and he still asked. This was a really interesting little nugget in Seth Hyatt's talk during the graduation. This was the only thing in his talk that really piqued my curiosity because he's describing here making a mistake as a circuit overseer. He's describing dealing with a situation in a way that in hindsight was flawed. Apparently this is something that Seth Hyatt can do as a governing body helper, fess up to getting it wrong. We don't really see this sort of language or this sort of attitude on display by governing body members, do we? This is really the distinction now that we're seeing between a governing body member like David Splain, like Samuel Hurd, and a governing body helper. The governing body helpers have to, where appropriate, fall on their swords and show how flawed and imperfect they are I can't really think of an example of a governing body member using this sort of language, because how could they? They have to come across as being perfect and wise. And if they were to ever show any weakness, if they were to ever show any shortcomings, what would that say about them being chosen by God? Would this, would this not be showing too much vulnerability? Would this not be sowing seeds of doubt in the minds of the brothers? No, it has to be the governing body helpers who again fall on their swords. But even though Seth Hyatt's candor is commendable, he's really showing a lot of naivety here, if you think about it. He's describing doing a shepherding visit 
with a Jehovah's Witness lady who was missing meetings. And it tells you a lot, by the way, that simply missing meetings will trigger a shepherding visit, not just from the elders, but the elders in this case informed the circuit overseer during the circuit overseer's visit, you need to go and see this sister. She's been missing meetings. <laughs> So in steps Seth Hyatt to ride to the rescue and render spiritual aid to this sister in the form of a shepherding visit. He reads a bunch of Bible verses, and as he's leaving, the lady says to him, you don't have a clue, do you? I could fully imagine that being the attitude of someone who's realized that the Jehovah's Witness religion is not true, is in fact wrong. Not just wrong, but abusive and exploitative. I could imagine saying that if I were in the shoes of this lady. I could imagine saying, you just don't have a clue, do you? And Seth Hyatt's immediate reaction was to view this as disrespect. He since looks back on that as an opportunity where he could have shown more interest, he could have been asking questions. The questions he thinks would have fixed this whole problem don't really apply if you are a Jehovah's Witness who stopped believing. He is suggesting that he should have asked, What do you want me to do for you? How may I help? What's been happening? In your life. None of those questions have any relevance or will help in any way if you've realized that the Jehovah's Witness religion isn't true. If you realize that you don't want any part of it anymore and can't sit through hours and hours of indoctrination because it's a waste of time and there are better things that you could be doing and you want to move on but you're in a captive organization that literally threatens you with family estrangement if you leave. How are these questions going to help? Oh, what can I do for you? What's been happening in your life? <laughs> if anything, what he's suggesting as the solution is to be more interrogatory. So you need to sit down and quiz the Jehovah's Witness who's missing meetings and ask them what's going on in their life from the viewpoint of someone who doesn't accept that there can be anything wrong with the religion. How can Seth Hyatt help if he's not in a position to change the policies? How can Seth Hyatt help if he's not in a position to fix the lies, to fix the broken promises, to fix the abuse, to stop the misery? He can't help. And it's frankly irrelevant what's been happening in someone's life. The problem is the religion, but you're never going to see the religion as the problem if you're an elder or if you're a circuit overseer, unless you happen to be Pimo and you're in your own process of awakening and trying to extract yourself from that situation. How can you have any empathy or any real sympathy unless you realize? that it's all a load of nonsense. Have you ever had an important decision suddenly thrust on you? You thought you knew the right thing to do, but as soon as you decide, you start having second thoughts, maybe even regrets. And now you can't stop thinking, did I do the right thing? This tendency to repeat a thought over and over again is called rumination. And when those thoughts make us feel anxious, it can be bad for our health. Some of you students made tough decisions before you came to this class. Thank you for that. And everyone right now is faced with challenging decisions every day. So what can we do to stop anxious rumination once it starts? Well, open your Bibles with me to Psalm 37, verse 5, and notice the advice that is given to us here. Commit your way to Jehovah, rely on him, and he will act in your behalf. 
Now, the word for commit here literally means to roll or remove something from our life. So as the footnote says, we need to roll our way, our concerns, our anxieties upon Jehovah. When we ruminate anxiously, we're holding on to our problem. But the Bible says through prayer, we have to take the problem off our shoulders and put it on Jehovah's. In other words, we no longer act as if the burden is ours. We need to leave it in his hands. So we're watching the 149th Gilead graduation, and this is Alex Reinmuller telling us how we can stop anxious rumination, or specifically, he's telling Gilead graduates, let's face it, this is who this talk is addressed to, he's telling Gilead graduates how to stop anxious rumination. In other words, he is envisioning a scenario in which they have regrets or they start to have anxieties, which is perfectly feasible once they have left the Patterson compound. They're no longer spending each day in close proximity to the governing body. They're no longer in this spiritual oasis. They're now back in their original countries or the countries to which they've been assigned doing the daily grind of being Bethel workers, translators, you name it. I remember how it felt after I graduated from the MTS class in 2005, which, as I've mentioned, is similar or modelled on the Gilead course. You leave this class, you leave this spiritual oasis, and it feels as though you're falling. It feels as though you've climbed your Everest and it's downhill from here. And it feels as though Alex Reinmuller's talk is anticipating the fact that after they've left, after they've had time to process their experience at Gilead and maybe realise that it didn't live up to their expectations in some way, I think this is a damage prevention talk. I think he is desperately trying to persuade Gilead graduates not to overanalyze things, not to ruminate on negative thoughts, and instead, as he puts it, commit their way to Jehovah. Just throw everything into serving Jehovah. Don't think about your doubts. Don't think about your anxieties. Put them to one side and focus fully on how brilliant it is to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses. But there's another message in his talk which I think is very revealing and very disturbing when it comes to the organization's attitude towards child sexual abuse. You'll recall Alex Reinmuller said, But the Bible says through prayer we have to take the problem off our shoulders and put it on Jehovah's. In other words, we no longer act as if the burden is ours. We need to leave it in his hands. Imagine if you take this attitude and apply it to something like reporting abuse to the authorities. What's being described here is abnegating responsibility, is saying, I don't need to do anything here. This is nothing to do with me. I'm just going to take this problem, which again could be someone in your congregation abusing a child. I'm just going to leave it in Jehovah's hands. The elders are on top of this. They know how to deal with this. They're getting the instructions from the branch. You can see how this sort of ideology, which is so lacking in responsibility, is essentially saying embrace denialism. Just deny that there's a problem. Deny that you have any personal responsibility to fix this and just throw everything on Jehovah. Leave matters in Jehovah's hands. In fact, that is how it was specifically worded in a previous version of the Shepherd book. You'll see it on the screen here. Elders were expressly told at one point that if there weren't two witnesses to an act of wrongdoing, they should leave matters in Jehovah's hands. Interestingly, this same wording 
has been watered down in subsequent versions of the Shepherd book. I think the organization themselves realized how terrible this looks in the context of child safeguarding. But we're seeing this whole attitude played out, aren't we, in this talk. If we apply this mentality in all areas, in all aspects of the life of a Jehovah's Witness where they run into problems, where they run into anxieties or troubles, if what they're expected to do is just leave it in Jehovah's hands, just roll things on Jehovah, and everything is going to magically sort itself out, how are you going to deal with abuse? How are you going to bring predators to justice and make sure children are protected? Now, verse 17 uses the same Hebrew word twice. The first time, it's translated as fearful. The second time, as awe-inspiring. And that may be because awe is a surprising emotion. It's a wonderful mix of inspiration and fear. You sense you're in the presence of someone or something greater than yourself, but it makes you feel small in a good way. Awe can humble you, and that shifts your thinking. It helps you to see things as they are and not as you expect them to be. It's the kind of fear Proverbs 1 and 7 says is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom. And that may be why at times Jehovah evokes awe in us. Like Jacob, People often say they feel more centered and spiritual after an awesome experience. Awe seems to pull us out of ourselves. It connects us on a deeper level with Jehovah, and it reconnects us with what is most important, Jehovah's sovereignty, his creation, and his people. If you've ever hiked in the Banff National Park, or walked in the Muir Woods, or felt goosebumps as you looked up into the night sky. You know what awe feels like. You've experienced Jehovah inspiring you. So the next time you need to get out of your head, remember awe. Take a walk in the woods. Sing your favorite kingdom song. Awe may be the most underutilized way we know to help us to stop ruminating on anxious thoughts and fully commit our way to Jehovah. Don't let your problems stress you out. Do your research, pray for guidance, make the best decision you can, and then let Jehovah inspire you with awe. That's the solution, apparently, when it comes to stopping anxious rumination. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses just need to have enough awe. Apparently, awe is the solution. They need to take a walk in the woods, look up at the night sky. Everything's going to work itself out. If you commit your way to Jehovah, bury your head in the sand, wait for Jehovah to fix things for you. That seems to be the message, again, aimed at a Gilead class that the organization will surely realize is now slightly more outside of their control than before and more prone, perhaps, once they are outside the walls of Patterson, to come down from this spiritual high <laughs> and realize that they're being lied to, that they're being indoctrinated into an abusive group. I do find it a bit peculiar, though, that the solution to anxious rumination is essentially something that almost any religion can offer. If you remember, Alex Reinmuller said, People often say they feel more centered and spiritual after an awesome experience. People often say they feel more centered and spiritual after an awesome experience. By saying people, he seems to be acknowledging that even non-Jehovah's Witnesses, people in the world, 
can have awesome experiences, including awesome experiences that they attribute to different gods and different religious beliefs. Well, doesn't that, if you think about it, expose the entire problem with religion, which is that you can have these experiences no matter what your theology is and no matter which God you're believing in. It becomes entirely arbitrary as to which religion you choose. And in many cases, people are just born into their religion, aren't they? And no matter which religion you're born into, through a sheer lottery of birth, it turns out that, as Alex Reinmuller has acknowledged, you can have awesome experiences. You can have, essentially, spirituality. Well, what does that really tell us? Doesn't that tell us, if you think about it, that there isn't really anything special about this particular religion if you can find or elsewhere? Now for you, students. Your journey to Gilead was different from others. You did not take the scenic route. But in Jehovah's strengths, you were able to look beyond the four walls of quarantine, beyond the lockdown, beyond the start of class being postponed. You looked beyond the dry, parched ground of the Baker Valley, and you saw Jehovah, Jehovah's blessing on his people as the governing body gave faithful and discreet direction to the worldwide brotherhood. You were right here. You watched it personally. So, though you may have arrived here weakened by your personal trials, after walking through your figurative Baca Valley in Jehovah's strength, you came out stronger, ready to appear, to appear before Jehovah God, to be trained by his organization. And then, it was finally announced the school would start in August. And I remember, I remember the day when you walked into the classroom for the first time and you sat in your seats and you opened up your student binder. You put your Bible on the desk. And as you looked up, your eyes revealed, I made it to my journey. And class began day after day. And it is noteworthy that in Jehovah's strength, not one of you, not one of you missed a day of class. That is to your credit. You wanted to learn every day. You took advantage of every opportunity. Thank you for the zeal that you showed. So in conclusion, take the Baker Valley route through all your challenges. There's a wise saying, a calm sea never made a good sailor. Likewise, don't trade hardships for comfort because you will feel a closeness to your heavenly father in a way that you never would have experienced if you hadn't walked from strength to strength through the Valley of Baca. That was so encouraging. Yeah, Roboron, that was so encouraging. What a way to conclude part one of the 149th Gilead graduation. Goodness knows what awaits us in parts two and three, if that's the level of wisdom and profound knowledge that we can look forward to. But yes, we've just been hearing from Mark Numer, who, in addition to being a governing body helper, is also a Gilead instructor. He's just been waxing lyrical about the class and about the students and about how brilliant it is that not a single day of class was missed by any students. Incidentally, they said the same thing at the end of my MTS class, how wonderful it was that not a single student missed a single day of the class. So I'm now feeling like my class, which is, again, based on Gilead, was a little bit less special, because apparently they just say this to all the classes. But there were two things in particular that stood out for me here. First of all, you'll have noticed where Mark Numer says, You saw Jehovah, Jehovah's blessing on his people as the governing body gave faithful and discreet direction to the worldwide brotherhood. You were right here. You watched it personally. Apparently, the Gilead graduates need to remember 
how faithful and discreet the governing body were in giving directions related to the coronavirus pandemic. Directions that were essentially follow the instructions given to you by the government. <laughs> that was essentially what people were told. Take this pandemic seriously, practice social distancing. Even in countries where they are easing restrictions, please continue to be careful and essentially follow the directions given to you by the World Health Organization. That was the wisdom of the governing body, to just act responsibly. Apparently, only the governing body or the faithful and discreet slave could give those directions. And again, don't get me wrong, I'm glad that they took that approach. I could easily imagine Jehovah's Witnesses taking a different path in response to the pandemic and following a fanatical approach of, well, we still need to worship, we still need to go to our meetings, we need to follow God's command no matter what the risk. I'm relieved that the governing body took the responsible approach, but I can't see it as being anything amazing or profound that they did the bare minimum. They did what they should have done, especially when you look at so many other areas in which the organisation and the governing body in particular are falling short and are putting people in danger. I also found it interesting where Mark Numair said, Don't trade hardships for comfort because you will feel a closeness to your Heavenly Father in a way that you never would have experienced if you hadn't walked from strength to strength through the Valley of Baca. Don't trade hardships for comfort. We don't want you to be comfortable, Gilead graduates. We, we want you to be suffering hardships as you make your way through the Baker Valley. And you might have been wondering watching this, what's he going on about, about this Baker Valley? Well, it all has to do with Psalm 84. We learned already during this Gilead graduation that it's not enough to just read the Bible you need to really mentally masturbate over certain details and fixate over certain details that are essentially inconsequential. And Mark Numair is fixating over a detail in Psalm 84 verse 6, which says, When they pass through the Baker Valley, they make it into a place of springs and the early rain clothes it with blessings. And Mark Numair is pointing out that the Baker Valley was a path to Jerusalem that was particularly inhospitable, so that if you were a Levite making your way through the Baker Valley on your way to Jerusalem, you would need to have the right attitude. You would be looking forward to getting to Jerusalem so much that you would be ignoring how dry and parched and inhospitable it is and imagining it as a place of springs. You would be so euphoric that you would basically be delusional and <laughs> pretending that you're not in a dry parched landscape. That's what he's describing when he keeps talking about the Baker Valley. It's not a valley filled with bakers or a valley owned by a baker. It's the Baker Valley. Anyway, apparently Gilead graduates, if they want to do things properly, they need to suffer hardship. They need to do it the hard way. They need to demonstrate that they're suffering in some way or going without in some way. And that way they can be special. That way their worship to Jehovah can somehow be more acceptable. And bear in mind that this graduation isn't just being seen by the graduates, it's also being seen by millions of Jehovah's Witnesses who are now watching this video, they're getting this same message that it's not enough to just read the Bible, go to the meetings, believe in Armageddon, etc. You've got to do it the hard way. There's got to be some suffering or some sacrifice. There's got to be some kind of denial of pleasure going on. And this for me speaks to a very fanatical undercurrent in the Jehovah's Witness religion that's always been there. We're seeing it here manifested in Mark Numair's talk. It's all very well for him 
talking about the need for hardship, the need to go without, the need for sacrifice, when he's living a very comfortable life in a Bethel compound where as a governing body helper, he is lavished with respect and adoration and all of his wants and needs are cared for. He doesn't have to worry about paying bills. He doesn't have to worry about grocery shopping. Everything's given to him on a plate. But he's asking Gilead graduates and by extension, Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide, you've got to be going without. There's got to be some hardship for your faith to give you meaning and satisfaction. But those were my thoughts on part one of the 149th Gilead graduation. Look forward to my rebuttals to parts two and three in the coming days. I'll get them to you as quickly as I can, but that's all I have time for. Don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.